Good morning, everyone, those who are awake. <laughs> I have a surprise for you. This session is going to be held in Spanish. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, as in the airports, they would say, you are in the plane that will go to social entrepreneurship and education. If anybody wanted to go somewhere else, it's the time to leave this plane. Um, yeah, we will be talking about uh, social entrepreneurship and its relationship to education. And these wonderful people who are here are very experienced, although very young, and they will be sharing with us their views, their experience, their learnings, and we will try to make this session as colloquial as possible. So feel free to write out your questions or ideas, and we'll have the opportunity to share them with this group. Um, let me tell you, we will be talking about what is social entrepreneurship, why we need social entrepreneurs if we need them. Um, what are the ingredients for social entrepreneurship? Uh, and some of the ingredients that they are going to share with you are quite interesting, surprising. It's good to listen to them. For instance, uh, should social entrepreneurs work with governments? Hmm, challenging stuff. Huh? Um, yesterday also, they came up with the idea of whether the social entrepreneurs should be sustainable, and how can they be sustainable. Also, we talked yesterday about how social entrepreneurs should migrate from the paradigm of success to the paradigm of caring. And we listened this morning to Dr. Patrick Awad talk about, talking about compassion as being one of the drivers of his dream to create a university. Then we also, they are going to be talking about uh, how these social entrepreneurs are weavers, mm -hmm. how they can articulate, how they do that. And this morning, I was struck by the comment by Dr. Farid when he said that it is so hard to build consensus in this post-truth world when people think that when you are comprom com compromising, you are betraying your tribe. Interesting thought. Should uh, social entrepreneurs compete or cooperate. Hmm? We're going to be talking about that too. And then uh, we might just uh, give a little time to talk about uh, social entrepreneurs being managers of conversation. In any case, um, let me ask these wonderful people to introduce themselves in two minutes each. <laughs> their lives comprised in only two minutes. So go ahead, Sarah. Thank you so much, and thank you for joining us today. And um, apologies in advance to those who our back is to and um, know that we're thinking about you as well. Um, the Skoll Foundation was established in 1999 by Jeff Skoll, who was the first president of eBay. And we invest, connect, and celebrate uh, social entrepreneurs and other innovators around the globe who are working on the world's most pressing problems. I am the director of the Skoll Community and Convenings team, and I have the distinct pleasure of working with all of our awardees to create community, collaboration, share best practices, um, and, and I, though I don't give out funding, the Skoll Foundation does. Um, uh, in unrestricted grants, and we've given out um, $400 million in unrestricted grants to over 100 organizations and 122 social entrepreneurs. Um, as part of my job, uh, we also convene our entrepreneurs and other innovators each year 
in Oxford, England at the Skull World Forum on Social Entrepreneurship. Um, we have other convenings as well, taking advantage of the UNGA week um, going, that goes on in New York each year. And then wonderful opportunities like this where we have our awardees present here at WISE. And um, I'm proud to say that of the six WISE Education Laureates, including the one that was so wonderfully announced this morning, we share four of those awardees. And we'll talk a little bit more about their innovations um, as, we, as we progress. Thank you. Um, I'm Clive Lee from Hong Kong. Um, I'm the CEO of the Yidan Prize Foundation. It was established by the founder of Tencent, the largest uh, internet company in China with over 1 billion users now. Um, and if you heard about uh, WeChat, it's actually uh, the Tencent's product. So our foundation uh, gives the world's largest um, um, education prize with uh, two categories, one in research and one in um, development because innovation can come from many different ways and we hope to try to bridge the gap between research and development to also support you know the policy makers making you know good policies with more evidence so each laureate will receive uh, four million US dollars including half as a project subsidy to scale up their projects um, I I'm really glad that um, uh, we got the invitation to come here because uh, we just uh, um, announced our first you know, inaugural uh, awardee to Becky Colbert, also the Vice Prize uh, winner. Thank you. Hi, I'm Gabby Arenas. And after 12 years working in the social sector, now I can say I am a social entrepreneur. Uh, I am the co-founder and director of TAP Foundation. It's an organization created to use innovation in education, arts, and communication for development to decrease violence in vulnerable communities in Latin America. I'm also a Choca Fellow and one of the members of Global Change Leader, an organization created to promote weavers between the change leaders. Uh, because we believe the innovation in education needs the co-creation in order to have more impact. And we are going to talk a little bit more about this in a few minutes, but I think right now what we learn in this process of being social entrepreneur is we must work together, not only with other social entrepreneurs, also with the teachers, with the institution, government, and create a really, really strong learning ecosystem in our communities. So I think after that, we are gonna watch a video, right? I really believe that education is a grace from God. And when I see children in school learning, they are happier, they are playful, they are not afraid. That is my inspiration. But of course, if a girl drops out of school, then it means that the next generation will be born into poverty. We as a global community are losing all that creativity, all that energy, if girls don't go to school. 60% of human beings are digital excluded. Our vision is inspire people be a change makers and use technology to transform themselves and transform their community. I'm trying to solve the problem by first focusing on remote areas where the indicators for the girl child are the worst and finding every single girl in those villages who's out of school. When you talk about educating people at a global level, billions of people, what's exciting about right now is the opportunity to fundamentally rethink that model. Knowing that you have the right to even speak out and say this is wrong, they started standing up against deeply entrenched practice that had lasted 2,200 years in Africa. What we are doing is teaching language and not communication. We are not teaching understanding, we are teaching comprehension. We are giving knowledge and not giving wisdom. 
If you need to change the destiny of a country, you need to fulfill the aspirations of every child. We've got a blueprint. This has worked for most of the villages and slums of Pakistan. Now the time is ripe. You are training for learning by doing, doing by learning. Memory is a necessary. Name screwdriver. Without quality basic education, you cannot maintain the goals in health or environment or in food security. Without quality education, there can be no economic development, no social development, no sustainable development. Across Teach for All, we are committed to tackling what we call educational inequity. All over the world, the privilege of kids' birth, their economic circumstances, their race, their gender, really predict their educational outcomes and in turn, life outcomes. Okay, well, I think that this world is very known to you anyway, so how about we start with Sarah and we just go on and then we'll move around. Do you have a question? <laughs> sure, I have a question. Sure. How did you enter this world? Why uh -huh. don't you tell us a little bit more about your background and then you start with uh, your experience so that people can learn from that beautiful experience you have. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, um, and thank you for your kind words. Um, I'm definitely not as interesting as the men and women that you've seen um, on that screen and who and the teams that exist beyond the men and women beyond on the screen, and so I will take my time to talk a little bit about them. Um, what we look for when we look for social entrepreneurs um, is that distinct originality of being able to work at the intersections of all different kinds of sectors, whether it's um, government, the private sector, um, the education sector, and, and all of sort of the entrenched parties that sometimes keep the status quo where it is. And we're looking for folks who can disrupt that status quo. And as we talked about a little bit yesterday, those who can see above, through, and beyond what currently exists to change it to a much more equal place for um, men, women, boys, and girls, um, and keep it and put it in a change it in a way that's sustainable so that um, it lives beyond that one project, that one classroom, that one organization. Um, and um, as you saw in the video, they're not easy to find, but I know there are plenty of them here at WISE. <laughs> I'm sure that um, you also have developed some skills to identify those uh, leaders or those social entrepreneurs. What are the ingredients that you looked uh, when you, as an organization, as a person, you, you looked them up? These individuals um, have a passion for collaboration, have a passion for stakeholder engagement. These are not singular players in the world. Um, they understand that to make um, to that old adage, if you want to go fast, go by yourself. If you want to make something that lasts, create a coalition. And uh, though it does take a 10, 20, 30 year trajectory, that's, that's the mindset of the folks that we are, we are interested in. Um, and that really creates that institution. There are so many new incredible innovations that, um, that we are learning about here at WISE and, and that you, many of you work in right now, whether it's the technological um, uh, types of things that are going in classrooms, there's FinTech, EdTech, all these sort of new ways of doing business. But at the end of the day, there's a child, there's a teacher, um, in some cases there's a computer, um, and really we wanna be able to change the mindset of those children to become democratic members of the globe, global, members and to be able to do that um, we need to teach them in new and innovative ways um, and not the old ways i mean this schooling has been the same um, in many areas for over 150 years and we don't expect that in our workplaces so why would we expect that in our children's classroom back when i worked at the department of education under um, uh, president clinton there was an old adage that the classroom uh, remains a museum to the history of of the parents who had been in the same classroom. And if it was good enough for them, it's good enough for your children. That's no longer true anymore with the age of AI and all the technological advances, the skill sets that 
we learned um, rote, mathematician, rote mathematics or learning um, how to spell, as Dr. Fareed Zakaria were talking about today in the plenary, we need to teach these brains to be nimble and flexible and compassionate and uh, understand that they are part of a global community, um, as well as teach the basics of STEAM and, and all the other um, things that make uh, a child, will help a child to succeed. Let's go to Clive. Um, you mentioned your story, and I think it's worth that these people know also how you started and why you became a social entrepreneur. Yes. Um, I was trained as an engineer uh, when I was in college. Um, and then I began my work you know, as an engineer for some years until uh, 2007. There's a big you know, natural disaster, you know, tsunami. And um, at that time, I made a decision. I quit my job and I committed you know, for humanitarian work, also youth empowerment work. My original planning would be one year, but uh, and then six years gone. And uh, I learned about social entrepreneurship, and it's so inspiring. I think it's more than just business you know, solutions, solving problems. It's about changing people's mindset unlocking the potentials people already have, let them realize that. Um, and then I have a uh, privilege to work in foundation and philanthropy, and that brought me to the position now. Um, I think social entrepreneurship is the sp spirit everybody should have to overcome challenges in their lives. Um, and previously, um, if I may share, you know, we have done a research it's called Worldwide Educating for the Future Index. Um, we commissioned economists to evaluate 35 economies, how they prepare the students for future. So it's not about what the student performance now, it's how we are enabling them for the future. And we realized something interesting. Um, so there are three categories um, in the research. First. Um, policy environment, teaching environment, and then socioeconomic environment. And each country actually have their own ways in ensuring quality education. And there I see social entrepreneurship play a really interesting role for unlocking you know, the system. Um, and I will challenge that we should not only have social entrepreneurs, but entrepreneurs from the corporate to influence to collaborate with the education sector. We should have teacher entrepreneurs and even you know, policy maker entrepreneurs in that way. Yeah. And um, what would you think of your experience? I know you went back to your previous uh, company and then you started working within that company. How did they accept you when, after those seven years of working as a social entrepreneur? Wow. I tried to skip that part, <laughs> but you mentioned that. So um, after the six years, um, I was uh, given an opportunity to work in a power company again as a regional CSR manager. So I see there's lots of opportunities and resources within the corporate, but at the same time, there's some limitations. It's not by the regulations, it's actually by the mindsets. How we see CSR within the company and also by the public. Um, for example, um, CSR in China is evolving and people are feel, you know, feel so enthusiastic of it. And maybe happening in other worlds, you know, they are um, having different progress. Um, so, I will see, I will always challenge what should we do to really meet the needs of the beneficiaries. And I had a chance, as I share, um, to really serve you know, those living under poverty in Hong Kong. And I insist that I should visit them to see how their lives and have a dialogue with them. I think that's essential. And, I, and at the same time, I think that experience transformed me. Um, and now in my work you know, in the Yilan Pais Foundation, I really visit into, in different countries to have a better understanding instead of sitting at the office, try to imagine you know, what's happening. And I'm glad that I came here to meet some friends here. 
<laughs> Thanks. Well, it's very interesting that uh, you mentioned about listening, because probably the best way of becoming a weaver is first listening. And that's why God gave us two ears and only one mouth. Um, what do you think, uh, Gabby? Why don't you tell us also a little bit about your, your background and how you end up being a social entrepreneur? Well, I used to be corporate social relationship manager in a transnational company in Venezuela. And I was really worried about the increasing of the violence in my country. And I had that feeling that all the strategies that the government and the enterprise and everybody was using was very similar and they don't have effect in the communities because the violence was going on and on, especially with the young people. And I know my husband, he is a visual artist and he was working with children in a school. And one of the things I see is all the, the teachers send him the most uh, violent children in the school. Go to the art, go to the classroom with the teacher of art. Every problem was solving in the art class. And I say, this is interesting. I was studying my master because I'm also an academic. And I talk with my mentor and I say, you know, I want to understand which is the relationship between art and violence and what happened when you use arts to decrease violence. And I start uh, research in those area and I found a very interesting, not only arts as visual arts or music or theater was very useful to decrease violence. Also the creative thinking, the possibility of innovate, to do the things in different way were very useful in process like disarm or peace building in so many countries in the world. And I start to create a program and I go for the company and I say, I want to do this program in a community. And the um, company answer me, we can make it because this is a lot of commitment. It's a long term process. And we are a company, you know, we, we can't do that kind of commitment with a, a community. And I say, okay, I'm going to do what a perfectly reasonable people do. I resign, I quick, <laughs> with a three months old baby, Ooh. and with a husband without work because he quick to create the foundation too. And we start, and we start to learn how to be social entrepreneurs. And at the beginning, when we start to work in community, we used to work only with children and young people. And the children and young people became amazing, you know, they change and they know how to uh, work with others, make team building, uh, problem solving, was very creative, but doesn't work. After two years working in the communities, we realized if we don't work with parents, this kind of programs never going to work because the children go back to home and the violence was there waiting for them, you know? And the parents are, especially in, in Latin America, are very useful to use violence to teach children, you know? You have to be like very severe and you have to punish them in order to uh, make it better person. That is a cultural belief. And we start to work with parents and we think what used to be very difficult and it wasn't. The parents were very engaged in the programs. And we say, well, now we have to include the teachers because the next step must be the schools. You know, it's very uh, rational thinking. And when we try to do it, it doesn't work because the teachers don't want to work with artists. What do you know about education? I am the teacher. I know what I have to do in my school. You don't know anything about education. And I say like, wow, okay, maybe I need to study education. And we do that, we start to study education and we start to understand how the system work. And after six years, we can really co-create with the schools. 
But at the beginning, the resistance was very, very high. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I thought they were, they were already r running out of time because somebody approached. <laughs> um, Gabi, um, you most done, many of us know how hard it is to work with government. How do you, how do you think, what do you think that uh, social entrepreneurs sh should do? How do they do this of working with government? What is your experience about that? I think it's as hard as work with teachers. <laughs> but what I think as a social entrepreneur who working in education, you have to see the holistic learning ecosystem from outside. You know, at some point you, you have to take a step out and watch the possibility of relationship in the learning ecosystem. And when you understand the importance of that relationship, you can uh, realize how to work in a different way with all the players, you know, with the governments, with the parents, with the schools, with the principals, other social entrepreneurs, also with, I don't know, international organization or business uh, in the community. But I think it's important to understand that as a social entrepreneur, you have to become a weaver. You have to figure it out how to learn different points of view, how to listen everybody, understand that everybody is important player, have different roles, and everybody had needs, and uh, start to co-create a uh, common vision, integrating all that uh, point of view, you know? It's not about I to say I'm right because I know, as the teachers say in the classroom, it's not about, uh, I know because I have more experience, it's about what happens if we take what you know, or what you know, the experience, or the fund, or the government's idea, and we integrate all together in a really, really cooperative and co-creative ecosystem. Um, several of the models that we've seen that have worked well um, include the government in different ways, and, and as we all know, government has uh, much power, but also has many limitations. And um, there are many laws around the world that talk about primary education and um, the number, you know, that that, that young, um, that children, bo both boys and girls, need to be enrolled in schools, um, but don't lift a lot of fingers to make that happen. And and so one approach that we've seen that has been terrifically, terrifically successful in the developing world um, include peer-to-peer -peer outreach. So there's no one who can influence a child like another child, especially those teenagers. Um, and so many of our organizations start alumni groups. So CAMFED with Ann Cotton has a very rich network of alumni girls who recruit other alumni girls to become part of a governance system within the education bureaucracies that go on in Africa. So now you've got a, once a girl child, now a leader within um, that government system making those decisions and speaking on behalf of other girls. Um, in in um, India, there's an organization called Educate Girls, um, who's run by Safina Hussain, and they too have an alumni group, uh, a recruiting group called Team Balika, and they go around to each of the villages to see who is not in school that day and um, entice them, motivate them, um, encourage them to come and then become part of um, a, a very progressive and, and self-reinforcing community. Um, and, you know, Gabby spoke to the safety issue, you know, in, in, in many areas, uh, it's just unsafe for a girl to leave her home and, and take that trip to school every day. And so uh, by having a group bring you to school or have the, the alumni support you in that, um, in that what seems to be such a simple effort to go to school, as you know, is so complex around the world. Um, and so using, not using, but um, leveraging all of those uh, girls who have gone through that education system and helping them to help the new generation of girls seems to be a really um, successful approach and, and we'd love to see more of that. And I uh, also want to add a point. So um, I think we tend to be um, conservative about having engagement or discussion with the politicians. But at the end, 
we should all understand in the civil society, we should all engage politicians. We should all engage these kind of dialogues. It's not only for ourselves, but for our world, for our future. So um, I will suggest, because I also went through this process in the past, for uh, social enterprise, begin small, but deep. Really understand the issue, and then grow with the community support, scale up, and then the government see the results. And they will come to you and consult you. At that time, don't refuse. <laughs> yeah. For example, in Hong Kong, there's a social enterprise. It's called Diamond Cap. So they bring uh, you know, accessibility to disabled people. So they have uh, like a taxi uh, that can you know, put a wheelchair there. Eventually, they went very successful, and the government adopt a new policy of subsidizing this. They don't directly subsidize the social enterprise, but they open the policy. So I think it's a quick sign. And we have previously a conversation about abundant, uh, abandoned uh, ability, the power of letting go, learning to let go when things come, when the opportunities come for a better, better and bigger picture, yeah. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, the idea is that uh, sometimes we want to stay in a place because it's wonderful, it's beautiful, and it's probably the best moment to leave and to train somebody to take, to take over. And we should, as social entrepreneurs, go and light another lamp somewhere else where it's always dark. Uh, Bojana, can we see that slide about uh, what is social entrepreneurship like, or what should uh, social entrepreneur? Um, this is a definition by Martin and Sally Osberg. Uh, what is social entrepreneurship? It's identifying an unjust situation, identifying the opportunity, and try to create a permanent solution that will solve that injustice and uh, create a better world. Um, we have many examples of that, but um, how about if we talk a bit about it, uh, um, Sara? Uh, what, what does that slide bring to your, your experience, to your thinking? What can you share with us about sure. it? I'm thinking about the different approaches. Um, each region, each country has different contexts within which you all work. And um, there are different ways of affecting or disrupting those, um, those unjust status quo. So by identifying a system that's not working, um, an opportunity that can weave, we've been talking about weaving, that can weave together the different stakeholders, parents, the private sector, the, technologic, the te technology sector, um, uh, the government, um, whatever it may take to actually move the system from unjust to just. And then going back to our conversation about governments, that is how it's going to be sustained. So I, we see success when a government entity, a department of education um, or an education minister sees the worth and value of the disruption that you've made and then adopts it. So you can't make too many enemies <laughs> as you are moving through your disruption. So it's a very tricky, tricky navigation that I think social entrepreneurs um, have, to, have to really um, embrace. And that, that's not for the faint of heart, as, as you can tell. Um, one interesting approach um, that I'm sure many of you, if not all of you know about, with regard to Khan Academy, I mean, they started working outside of the school system and really using video technology to, dis to disrupt um, and inform the gaps that exist, particularly um, in Western schools, and I, well, actually, probably all schools. And one of the things that has always struck me about Sal Khan and his innovation is he, he, he really put a finger on the pulse of graduating from one class to the next, so from first grade to second or second to third, and he gave this analogy that I've never forgotten, and that is, when you learn to ride a bicycle, you don't just sort of learn how to, you don't get a B plus or a B in bicycle riding or a C and then move on to the next 
phase of bicycle riding, you either learn how to bicycle ride or not. You learn how to swim or not. And here we are graduating these children from one grade to the next when they are uh, at a subpar level with regard to academics. And that seems very irrational, to, to point out Gabby's rational word from before. It seems very irrational. And yet, this is an entrenched system that we all accept. And he said, no, I'm not going to accept that. I'm going to create a new system outside of school to help fill those gaps so that every student can learn at their own pace and get an A and master what it is they need to master. And, um, and although many of us have watched these videos outside of the classroom, um, many schools are now adopting this system um, within the classroom. And so I, I think um, there's, that's a disruption that's outside of the education system. But now as the education system adopts that mentality and now has a tool to use that's free, by the way, um, we're seeing this become more sustainable. So I think that's a, it's a very encouraging. Um, Gavi, uh, this is, uh, stirs a, a, a question here um, about uh, art. Because uh, the same thing as you either ride a bike or learn to swim or, or die. How about art? I mean, how do you apply art and uh, you ha give B, B minuses or A plus to, to your children? How, how, do, how does it work? You didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I suspected but, that. Uh, there's something interesting about it. Most of the skill that you need to become a social entrepreneur, little children already have it. You know, they are creative, they, are, they take risk, they are empathetic, they know how to be with others. And when you are growing up, the structure of the educational system put a lot of these things away. They teach us how to compete, because if you want to be succeed, in order to be succeed, you have to be better than anyone else, you know? And they teach you how to be just caring about your family or yourself and not be aware about other people's needs around you. And if you put th all that stuff away in the development of the children, they will be keeping these abilities, you know? They will be empathetic, they will be creative, innovative. And when you was talking, I was thinking about when you are a social entrepreneur, you have to take risk, of course, because you have the freedom to do it. You are not attached to an institutional organization. You are not part of the government and the law. You, you can take risk. But when you are talking about social entrepreneurs working in education, these risks have to be very calculated, you know, because you are talking about human beings. You are talking about the development of children. And of course, you can do improve new methodologies and work with innovation, but you have to be very conscious of what are you doing and how you are doing it because you can affect the life of these children. And I think one of the reasons because the governments adopt the model of the social entrepreneurs is because we try the models, we try the methodologies, we use it, we know how to work. And when it's safe, the government and companies and institutions can say, okay, I want it because right now I know it's work. And I think that is the most important thing that the social entrepreneurs can do, bring innovations, bring cooperation and co-creation to do the thing in a different way and to allow the children to really unleash their potential, you know, to give them the opportunity that don't lose that skill that every one of us have. Fantastic. Um, you were talking about competition or cooperation. Um, Clyde, um, when you are considering the price, uh, which basically is based on competition, how do you, how do you manage these two worlds? What do, you, what do you think of competition, cooperation? How, how does it work in terms of the price? Um, first, I need to declare that I'm not in the judging committee. <laughs> so um, it's managed by the independent judging committee, but uh, I, I, I want to share because uh, our prize focus on four criteria, future oriented, innovative, transformative and sustainable. So you can see the terms itself is kind of abstract. 
And what is essential is actually invisible to the eye, um, according to Little Prince. Huh? <laughs> so we leave the room for the expert to decide you know, where the price should go. But according to our first year you know, uh, evaluation, um, what truly differentiates are the personalities really willing to take their work further and seeing it beyond their own projects, but how they collaborate with other stakeholders in the community. So I think it's the beauty of education. When we set up the prize uh, within a short journey, we are so glad we visit you know, school forum and visit uh, many organizations, uh, Ahsoka, etc. So they've given us lots of opportunity, insights, wisdom to set up the prize. And we had a conversation with Bill Gates, and he mentioned that there's not enough you know, uh, investment in education research, unlike science, you know, medical field. So I think education is beauty because we collaborate. So I think now is the time we really break the walls. Let's build the bridges. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Go ahead, uh, Sarah. When I think about education, um, specifically in the U.S. and, and, um, and potentially uh, around the world, uh, we are teaching children to be independent operators. You know, you, you, you learn, you sit down by yourself, you take the test, and you get a grade. And that does not apply anymore in the world of the future uh, workplace. And so having these um, opportunities for children to work together in collaborative ways, in groups, um, with art um, and not think of themselves as just an individual operator getting an individual grade. I mean, that's a paradigm. That's the 150-year-old paradigm, and it's a hard nut to crack, especially if schools are um, being measured on test scores. So we have a long way to go uh, before we can fill, change the gap between how a student is learning in a classroom and how um, a productive and successful human is working in the workplace. Well, you brought a very important point that um, recently we were with um, Fernando Reimers at a workshop, and um, he was mentioning that um, in many places they are reducing the number of hours devoted to cognitive uh, matters, and they are devoting more time for children to learn how to relate to one another, to be more compassionate, to be more artistic, uh -huh. I even, that reminds me that uh, I have uh, a friend who is a social entrepreneur and he says that he's an artist and he says that um, children who play Mozart in the morning do not break windows in the night. Uh, so I think that's a very important way of putting it. Um, in any case, um, one of the things that um, is almost a rhetorical question should we or do we need social entrepreneurs? And actually, the people here um, had this uh, question, and people voted. Can we s can we show that uh, Bojana and see what people think about it? One, two. I can't see behind. <laughs> uh, well, uh, first of all, thank you for uh, you know all your uh, testimonies and stories, Gabi, you especially. Um, you know, being a mother of a three-month-old baby and both without a job, my hat is off to you for getting it that far. So, so really, congratulations uh, to what you've done. And that's also my question for the two of you, uh, taking Gabi back to when she started and also maybe on behalf of other aspiring social entrepreneurs here. Uh, the organizations you fund for good reasons um, doing great work, but they've also already enjoyed a specific level of traction and visibility. So it's not maybe Gabi in the very beginning of her foundation because you don't have the traction, you don't have the visibility, and you might not be able to be shortlisted by your organizations. Um, that's, this is no criticism, by the way, this is just an observation. But what would, you, what would you advise as organizations to those people that wanna make a difference, um, but are still very much in the early phases, and, and, and how what would you do to help them? That's my question. Thank you. Um, thanks for your question. I think it's very valid. Um, so um, 
through our conversation with um, social entrepreneurs and also education innovators, um, our founder has decided to commit even more. So we are setting up a new foundation for grant making for early stages um, projects, initiatives that has the potentials. I myself, um, I'm an I'm also a social entrepreneur. I'm running uh, my own organization, you know, now on a wise report um, in Hong Kong. And I have mentees over 1,000 in Hong Kong. So I see the huge potential in investing in youth and uh, in all social entrepreneurs at early stage because they can do amazing things that you can never imagine. And one person um, I previously invested in, uh, he recently won a big prize in Geneva, technology, in technology, uh, using uh, fish, you know, transgenic fish to, for water testing. Yeah, and that's amazing. So I think we need more people, um, philanthropists, corporates, and, um, you know, big international organizations to open up the gateway, try to question ourselves why we are doing this, setting up those boundaries and limitations, can we really unleash the potential and resources we have? Um, I pay highest respect you know, to social entrepreneurs who have devoted themselves for so much, not only themselves, but also their families. Yeah, thank you everyone here, yeah. Thank you for the opportunity to answer that. Um, while we don't fund um, uh, early stage organizations, um, there are many, many in our pipeline that we look at and follow year after year and really keep an eye on um, and the trajectories that they are following themselves. Um, Jeff Skoll has a very simple saying or had, well, he, he learned it from, from, um, from Gardner, who, who he was very much uh, in, uh, influenced by in his early stages, but bet on good people doing good things. Um, and we still believe that at the core. And I think um, in giving any advice to those who have um, innovative ideas that are, that, they, that are off the ground, that are trying to get some traction, um, there are many types of networks and organizations that we look to as referral partners, whether it's Ashoka or Echoing Green or the Aspen Institute, um, uh, different networks that they have under their umbrella. Um, approaching us at meetings like this, we, we tend to do a lot of uh, networking at different organizational meetings, um, whether it's in a vertical like education or, or more of an um, of umbrella um, uh, meetings, I guess. There's no more CGI, but that used to be one of the places that we do. Um, and even our own, or, uh, you know, the Skull World Forum is, is a key place where we set up um, hundreds of meetings where we learn more about the trajectories of the organizations that these people are running. We also look at the bench. So while we celebrate the entrepreneurs themselves who have started these organizations and, and have this brave uh, ability to take these risks for everybody else, um, we also look at who's behind them because uh, we are all human, and um, although Gabby seems superhuman, um, I, I think she's probably a human under there. <laughs> um, you know, the ability for her to recruit and retain a team around her who can sustain the work that she's uh, originating, that she's founding, is key as well. Um, and we tend to fund those organizations who are at a, at a distinctly mezzanine level. Um, and I know that sounds a little obtuse, um, Clive mentioned the word, um, if, uh, when he was describing his prize, it, it, it rang true a little bit for us as well. Um, it is different in each region. Obviously, if you are in Afghanistan and Pakistan and some very emerging economies, um, that's going to look different to us than somebody who's trying to do some work in Brazil or in the United States, uh, for example. Um, so different, so mezzanine means different things in different regions. Um, but get involved in those different networks, and those referral partners are, are really, really key. Raul, I know the question was for these two guys, but I want to add something as my experience. At the beginning, when you start an organization, of course you have the passion to do the changes that you are trying to drive through, but also there is a lot of pressure, you know? Uh, I remember when I started, 
12 years ago, I was very young and I started to receive prize and press interviews and everybody was amazed about the work that we are doing, especially because we were, we was in very, very dangerous communities. And at some point, if you don't have, or you don't take time to be very conscious of what you are doing and why you are doing it, all these attentions could be dangerous for you as a social entrepreneur, you know, because you start to believe you are a superhero that is totally not true. We are human, as you say. Uh, we have needs, we have families, we also are uh, emotionally involved of what we, we are doing, especially when you work with children, you know. And I think the social entrepreneur have to make the journey. You have to learn, you have to grow, you have to understand how to create a team. Uh, I remember the first time someone said to me, I'm going to give you a million of dollars to do a program. And everybody say, oh, Gabby, congratulations, a million of dollars is amazing. Think what you can do with that. And my first thinking was, I don't want it because I'm not prepared for this. This could be dangerous for my organization, could be dangerous for myself. And I came back to the finance and I say, I don't want it. I want a half and I want to prove what I can do with that. After I can prove I can make it, I want a million dollars. And at the beginning, you have to understand how to do it. It's better for you, it's better for the organization, and also especially it's better for your beneficiaries because at the end of the day, what is really matter when you are a social entrepreneur is why is you are doing this, which is your mission. Not only the passion or what you can do as a person, is the people for who are you working. I just want to uh, point out a quick um, follow-up. The Skull Foundation, one of the distinct pleasures I have is working with our entrepreneurs on their wellness. And I think as, um, as foundations become more sophisticated in how they support their grantees, understanding the humanity, uh, the environment that they're in, what they're trying to do, and what the toll it may be taking on themselves and their family um, is huge. And um, not only is it, it, it could be a detriment to the human, but to the organization that you funded as well. So it's a, um, it's a self-enlightened, I think, approach. But at the end of the day, um, being able to support awardees and grantees emotionally um, is, 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 I think, the next step in foundations becoming more empathetic in the work that we do. Okay, this is a very interesting uh, discussion. I have two uh, maybe related points, questions. So when we talk about uh, innovation, technology in education, then often this is done by people who have not really the connection to the educational sector, and I'm one of those. So I'm here from the Qatar Computing Research Institute where we developed an e-book reader. Originally for the e-back initiative here in Qatar, it was field tested in its schools and so on. So how do we now actually connect to where it might be, might be used? So a few months ago, we visited the um, Ministry of Education in Kenya, where they roll out 1.2 million devices into the schools. So they have the money for the devices. They may not have the money for the content, and they definitely didn't want to pay now actually for the software. You can download the software all the time, but this comes now to sustainability, right? If we give it now, can we support it next month, next year, right? So then when, we, when I hear now impressive numbers, 400 million U US dollars or whatever, you know, 100 organizations, probably you had to turn down 1,000, 10,000 for this, right? So the related questions here is, how can all of this come together when I'm sitting in one silo, but I feel I have something which could contribute? How do I even connect now? Because I see those who need it don't have the money to pay for it, right? So there has to be, you know, the, the funding organizations who actually pay for it, that technology can be deployed and sustained in the environment where it's actually uh, needed. So it's not clear if, if there's even a question here, but just, you know, some of my experience in developing something, but then actually failing to really put it out there to put it to good use. Thank you. 
I don't mean to take over the microphone here, but um, I too am a little dubious about um, uh, technological solutions that cost a lot of money for um, educational purposes. I do believe education is a right, um, and so making money from your uh, technology um, tends to tends to make me feel a little uncomfortable as well. Um, but I was I, w I had a point about. Um, uh, oh, I just got off on my tangent. Um, you were talking about the sustainability. Oh, so uh, Educate Girls, um, it, the organization that was featured up, one of them that was featured up there and that I mentioned, um, uh, has the first L ever development impact bond. How many of you are familiar with that, with that term, development impact bond or social impact bond? So, um, they have an under. They have received uh, two hundred and thirty, two hundred and forty thousand dollars from a financial in institution that is underwritten by a foundation. So um, it's the first ever uh, pay for per pay for performance in the sector of education. They've done this before in recidivism, in prisons, um, but this pay for performance means that the original investor. Well, c could stand to receive up to 30% back for each dollar that they invested. But the underwriter, which is um, the Children's Investment Fund, of, um, which is in London, uh, underwrites this so that if it doesn't succeed, they don't lose the money. So now there's a whole new, it's opening a whole new door for investment in schools in a performance level. So back to your question about how do schools pay for it? Well, this may be one way of doing, taking those risks where the school isn't using their own money and a foundation is underwriting that of an investor. And, and so we're keeping a very close eye on that. Yeah, this is a very in interesting um, subject that we can discuss after this. Um, because it's, it's gonna, yeah, but I, I have a lady here and a lady here and then we'll go this way, <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, we'll, we'll go after it. Okay, lady first. Hi. Um, I'm Siham Al Awami. I'm uh, working for Save the Dream. Um, I have my question is uh, actually to all three distinguished um, uh, speakers. Uh, we uh, empower youth and protect uh, children through the sport values. And my question to you is. Um, um, okay, we try to, through, through the power of sport, is to attract the children, uh, get them uh, interested, and then help them to go to school or, or, or get them to, in the, on the right track. But have you ever tried uh, to use also the sports and sports values to help uh, achieve your programs? And this is actually to all um, uh, three of you. And would you also be interested in organizations who are experienced in this field to also help uh, uh, your, uh, uh, to achieve your uh, goals? Thank you. Well, you know, at the beginning, when we start to realize how to work with children and especially with young people, we start with arts because we are an artist in our organization. But it, at some point, we realized not every single kid is interested in art. Some of them are interested in sports, other in technology, other in mathematics or science. And we start to work with different uh, tools and methodologies. And what we learn is it doesn't matter what you use. You can use technology, you can use sport, art, politics, whatever. What is important is give the children and the young people the opportunity to unleash their potential. And I remember one uh, experience was a young boy, he lived in a very, very violent community, but he was very interested in learning, you know? He was so poor and most of the time he can go to the school because he don't have a uh, choose to go. And we started to work with him and with his family. But at some point in secondary school, one teacher told him, why you are here? You're never going to be able to graduate. And if you graduate, you are not going to be anything. Because you can't, you know? You came from a very poor community. You don't have anything. 
you're never going to be an engineer, for example. A teacher told him that. And when he came back to organization and said, I'm going to drop out the school because the teacher don't believe I can graduate. We talked with him and told him, my husband, Carlos, told him, what do you like to do? And he said, I like to watch. I, I have the needs of see my community differently. And he gave him a camera, a photographic camera, with the compromise of end the school. I teach you how to become a photographer, but you end the school. Right now, this young boy is a professional photographer in Venezuela. <laughs> and could be, you know, I don't know, baseball player or whatever. What is important is to give them the opportunity. Most of the time we are saying to our children, you can make it. You are not be able, you are not successful enough. We tell ourselves every time. And that's the reason we are not able to cooperate because we are trying to be better of someone. I, if you give them the opportunity to be happy and to do what they want to do, they are going to make it using a sport or whatever. Um, my, my best friends from um, India, he runs an organization called Oscar Foundation and also we receive a, a, a prize you know, from Ashoka. I visited him in Mumbai previously and, and he's still you know, having his NGO in the slum. Um, when he began the journey, he, you know, teach the kids, you know, with football. But football is actually a means of empowering them, raising them, uh, their self-esteem. And then the kids got so, you know, uh, energetic about what they can do, you know. And then the, the parents ask them, uh, why are you doing football? Huh? Why are you playing? Uh, so, my friend called uh, Asok and told the kids, so now you must study well and prove to your parents sports will enable you to become even a better person. And then they succeed. And the next step he took, um, he saw all those who are joining his programs are boys. And then he asked the parents, why are you letting your girls at home? If you are not letting them, John, I will just <laughs> kick out your voice. <laughs> and eventually, the girl is gone. And now, today, uh, Ashok and o Oscar Foundation travel in different continents. And he told me he was the first one in his slum leaving India. And because he was invited to give speeches you know, in TED Talk, he practiced his English. And uh, now he's like traveling all over the world. And uh, previously I saw a photo on Facebook, um, the prince from the uh, UK visited his organization in Mumbai. I think sports, amazing, you know, it teaches how to overcome the challenges in life. Um, I wish I met someone like you, you know, earlier, because uh, <laughs> I was one of them who were told, you can't do it, just stay and watch. <laughs> I still would like to hear your opinion, um, please, about the same subject, the, sport, the use of sport. Yes, because uh, all three, please. <laughs> if you've ever tried to uh, also uh, uh, use the power of sport uh, to achieve your goals as well with the uh, work that you're doing. Um, while I personally believe that, and Title IX in the US has done amazing things to bring young girls out onto playing fields um, and equalize that opportunity and teach us the same kind of teamwork and sport ethic that um, our young men and boys have been learning for millennia. Um, it is not something that Skoll necessarily funds. Um, in, in a, it's a very, that's a very singular, it seems to be a very singular um, uh, um, type of, of um, siloed or you know a very singular intervention whereas we typically look at the whole school system from how the bathrooms can accommodate the girls and the plumbing and and getting girls there to um, access and quality and then back to the family uh, that allows and helps 
um, girls and boys get to schools. So while I personally believe it, it's not something that school currently funds. Uh, I would like to thank all the speakers today. We, we really like hear a wonderful thoughts from all of you. Uh, I have two questions. My first question is regarding managing learning within the organization. So we understand we can start, we can fail, but how can I manage my learning? Like I, I can recall uh, Gabrielle saying, we, we thought we can work only with child, but then we realize we need to talk with parents, with teachers, and uh, etc. How can I think about this? with taking into consideration my capability as a, as a venture. I, I am capable to work o with all of those people or this, is, this could, not, could not happen, uh, taking into account my resources and all of the other things. My other question is related to the social venture sustainability. We understand that, uh, as I understand, it's fine if we don't work with the government. It's fine if we, if we work by ourselves. It's, it, is a, it is a good to co-create with all stakeholders, but we can, we can, uh, we can do something uh, by ourselves. But how can we, we're not doing our ventures for one year or uh, we're doing it for 10 years, for 1,000 years to come. How can we keep it sustainable in terms of impact? How can we keep it changing with time to cope with all the changing that's happening around us in the world? So I would like to hear all of your opinions around this. Thank you very much. Uh, for your first questions, uh, in my experience where I learned, first you have to be very nerd, okay? Nerd. You have to study a lot, read a lot, uh, chat a lot with people with experience. I think it's very important to talk with others to have experience in some fields. Uh, and a study, study, study. But it's most important if you create a team, okay, of a specialist in different area. I'm not a specialist in art. I'm not an artist. But I have a team of artists working. I'm not educator. I'm a journalist, you know? And after a few, uh, problems with teachers. I do a specialization in education, but it's not my career, my principal career. But I have teachers in my team, you know? And also I have uh, legal advisors, uh, accountability. You don't know, you don't have to know all the areas related with your work, but you have to have a good, good team. And for your second question, sustainability is the key if you want to create high impact. Because one of the reasons why the social entrepreneurs are competing all the time is because they are trying to survive, you know? And there's few funds around the world and you have to compete for money. Uh, but if you create a sustainable organization, funds are not a problem for you and you can be totally focus on your impact or in your project, you know? How to do that? Learning. I learn a lot uh, working with triple impact uh, investment, uh, working with uh, business men, you know, they teach me a lot. And right now, 91% of the budget of my organization is produced by ourselves. We are sustainable. We are not depend of any fund. It's good if someone give you a prize, it's very nice, and if someone tell you, I have money to cooperate, but it's not necessary. And when it's not necessary, you don't need to compete, and you not, are not worried about finance. You can be focused. And my advice will be, first, develop this sustainable uh, business model, social business model for your organization. Prove it during one or two years, and you will see all happen change. <laughs> I have two advices. Uh, first, um, I think we need to distinguish what we can do and what we want to do. And when the funding opportunities comes, you know, stay calm. You should realize, you know, those funding may be just one off or lump sum, right? So that I will, I will highly encourage the social entrepreneurs to use it to develop new models or new initiatives that can seek for other fundings. So it's for testing, like a lab. Huh? Um, 
second thing, uh, financial literacy is compulsory for all the staff. It's not just for the accountant or CEOs. Everyone should be transparent. Uh, I learned it from my own family, <laughs> you know, um, background. I, um, I, I grew up from a very humble background. And uh, I had an experience when the financial crisis, you know, hit uh, Hong Kong a lot, you know, in 2000 something. Um, I really, you know, sat down with my parents and all the family members and discussed and used Excel to calculate all the, you know, all the items. And then we learned how to be realistic. <laughs> Everyone. Yeah. Hi, I'm Maha from Morocco and the US. I truly enjoyed the conversation this morning. My question also connects this session to the conversation earlier this morning on post-truth world. Also social entrepreneurs, we live in a post-truth world, especially on social media, where you need constant exposure, constant posting, constant presence. And also we live in an era of trends. No matter if it's in, in any sector, there are trends. And then we have to keep altering our own mission to meet those trends, to get funding and exposure, etc. My question is, where do we draw the borderline between um, our own values, our own cause, and our own rhythm, and what's been imposed from us from outside to make sure that at the end of the day, we're true to our core self instead of satisfying external pressure? Thank you. I think the most important thing is be ethic, you know, be transparent and be aligned with your mission. If, if you do that, maybe some people don't like it, maybe you're not trends or not the most popular social entrepreneur, but just live well, you know, and you feel your succeed. Maybe not in the succeed, uh, concept for everybody, but you are okay with yourself, you know? And the second thing will be be empathetic, because, because most of the time, the understanding of the reality depends of the point of view where the people came, you know? But most of the time is you talk, and you learn how to listen, and you learn how to dialogue with other people. You understand there are most the things that put us together, that the things have uh, taken us apart. And being empathetic, be ethic, and be very, very connected with your mission. I think on a final note, I'll say from the Skull perspective, and hopefully from others as well, we don't fund the most popular. We don't fund because you have you know, so many hundred thousands of likes on your Facebook page or your Twitter account. Um, we fund what works, um, and we fund those ethical core, core uh, values that Gabby was talking about, um, and those aren't always transparent on social media. So be yourself, and I'm sure it'll be great. Wonderful, my friends. Uh, they deserve it, certainly. If I might just, uh, you know, close up this wonderful conversation that we can carry on. They are going to be around the next couple of days. Um, but um, I hear a lot about uh, the question that was, we were asked. And uh, we, we should not become mercenaries and go after the money. Actually, I have, uh, I have this feeling that there are more resources, there's more money than good ideas and good hearts. Um, what I've been told by a philosopher from Colombia is that uh, mankind has conquered the world, the deepest depth, the highest mountains, the driest desert. Now, what do we do with that? It's caring. So probably what we should be doing is shifting from this paradigm of success. What is success? Maybe success is caring for one another 
and building a more compassionate world for our children. So with that, I would like to thank you very much for spending the time with us and we'll see you around to continue this wonderful conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you.